Students uh, Business Unit. Uh, the uh, presenter will be introduced to uh, Alistair Doma, a Senior Vice President and Executive uh, Officer CEO of Railway System Business uh, Unit. Uh, explanation will be provided in English, so, so those of you who wish to listen in Japanese, uh, please use the translation receivers. Uh, if you do not uh, have a receiver, uh, please let our staff know. We will start the presentation now. Uh, Doma-san, please. Uh, konnichiwa. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alistair Dormer, uh, and I'm the CEO of the Rail Systems Business Unit. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the short video that we wanted to show you just before my presentation, because I think it shows how the railway sector touches so many people's lives in all of the products and the services that we deliver for our customers. And, and some of you may have noticed that on that video was actually our Sentosa monorail uh, in Singapore, uh, which maybe, maybe the president of the US and the president of North Korea may be riding uh, in uh, next week or so. So maybe we're contributing to world peace. I don't know. But uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's start the presentation. So starting looking at the, the, the railway business, where have we come from? Well. We've worked really hard over the last three or four years to create a fully integrated offering of products and services across the whole of the, the railway sector. Now we enter the period of the digital revolution. We've been working very hard in terms of how do we develop our portfolio of products and services to be smart, to be connected, and to create better value for our customers. So later on in the presentation, I will share with you some of our progress on how we are developing ourselves in terms of technological leadership of the sector by the combination of our fully integrated offering with digital offerings. We're now a very global business. Um, when I joined uh, as CEO of the railway business back in 2014, we have dramatically globalized our business. We've experienced very, very strong growth of nearly 50% compound annual growth rate and experienced tremendous change within our business to transform our business so that the vast majority of our business is now uh, outside Japan, even though our Japanese business remains constant and stable. We're operating in 27 countries around the world, and we have now 12,000 people uh, working in Itachi Rail uh, across the globe. So here you can see the growth rate that we have. Um, we're working very hard to continue this. Uh, over the last two years, we've fully integrated the uh, Ansaldo Breda, now Hitachi Rail uh, operation into our business. And we've integrated our manufacturing and our design capability to create uh, a very powerful and complete lineup of products and services for our customers. Our challenge now is con to continue the growth, but also to improve our profitability. And I'll come on to that a little bit later uh, in the presentation about how we are seeking to do that. So let's have a look at our results in 2017. Year on year, we've improved on every single one of our uh, parameters. But let me highlight uh, just two areas. From a profitability point of view, we had two non-recurring issues where we had to make a provision, uh, one in Sweden and one in uh, Vietnam. Both of these are subject to um, civil claim actions, so uh, we expect recovery. Uh, so they're really one-off events. Those of you who, who've seen this presentation before uh, will notice that, or will know that over the last few years, the, the free cash flow position from the railway sector has been fairly miserable uh, due to the significant contract we had 
in the United Kingdom, on the IEP uh, trains. Well, we've managed to transform that situation last year with the delivery of the first trains into service. And that triggered a significant down payment into uh, Hitachi Rail. So we're, we now have a, a, a very healthy free cash flow position. So I think looking at the achievements and what we've been doing, I mean, firstly, I, I wanted just to update you on the progress of the Intercity Express program because it is, has been a, a very, very important program uh, for the business. We were honored in June of last year that Her Majesty the Queen traveled on the train for uh, the first time, which was a, a fantastic publicity event uh, for us as a company. And then the train started operation uh, in October. Uh, in fact, only recently the trains were used to take people from London to the Royal Wedding. So again, we had people from all across the globe uh, enjoying uh, the Itachi train experience. In fact, I myself, when I'm in the United Kingdom, I'm using these trains on a daily basis, and the performance is now getting, getting very strong. So a very big achievement. Um, this year, we will deliver uh, the remainder of the Great Western Fleet and complete the first stage of operation. Next year, we move uh, to complete the second stage of the operation, which is the, uh, the East Coast main line, which goes from London up to Scotland. But our maintenance services are now fully activated, and we are delivering the service on a daily basis to our customer uh, in the Great Western region. But obviously, it's not just uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, we have contracts all over the world. So this is just a, a snapshot of a number of the different projects that we're delivering uh, to our customers on. And let me just highlight a few of these. Um, the Sagami contract here in Japan, we, we started deliveries uh, early this year, which will operate to the southwest uh, of the uh, Tokyo region. The ROC contract uh, in Italy, which was a very, very important contract for us to secure manufacturing uh, or capacity into our factories for the coming years, which is a very large framework contract for regional operators in Italy. And the first train is now successfully testing uh, on the test track, so we're, we're bang on program. And another very important uh, contract for us is in Australia, in, for Rio Tinto, where we have developed the most advanced train control system for driving autonomously 2.5 kilometer long freight trains from the mine to the port and then back to the mine again. Um, this is a tremendous technological achievement using satellite technology and advanced communication technology and is delivering tremendous benefits for Rio Tinto because we finally achieved the safety certification from the Australian authorities in December last year to start full driverless operation uh, in Australia. So a, a tremendous achievement for, for the team. Those are our existing projects. Clearly, we're winning more business. So we won, again, we increased our order book, um, our order volumes this year. So some notable successes here. In the United States, we won a very important contract uh, in Baltimore for both signaling and for rolling stock, which is important in the growing US market uh, for uh, the rail sector. And here in Japan, very important delivery of the N700S, which is the next generation Shinkansen, which is extremely important for our business going forward here uh, in Japan, and a number of other uh, contracts, as you can see there, around the globe. So let's look a little bit more uh, at the results. Well, you can see our order book uh, is growing uh, in terms of the, uh, the top line here. Okay, don't worry about that. In terms of the top line growing, um, our order backlog is very healthy uh, and, and continues to grow and stable, and our ratio of overseas business remains stable. Um, I've mentioned before 
our growth in revenues. Um, compared to our forecast last year, we have changed our numbers slightly. That is primarily due to the fact that we are using a different foreign exchange rate. Now, particularly in the United Kingdom, the post-Brexit effect of uh, the yen to uh, sterling uh, ratio has affected our numbers slightly. But other than that, we are consistent with our forecasts. A little more detail in terms of our revenue forecast for 2018. You can see here that 89% of our forecast revenues are actually within our backlog today. So we're very confident of achieving uh, the revenue forecasts that we, that we are making. In terms of free cash flow, we are making more investment into our business. I mentioned earlier the, the transition in terms of the digital world. We're making a lot of investments into our factories and in terms of technology uh, to make our position there as the technological leader uh, in the business. From a profitability point of view, you see historically there we've reduced our SG&A costs by 1%. In, F60, in 2016, we had uh, the integration and the integration costs. In 17, we've had the two non-recurring events. So we see the improvement back in 2018 to back to where we, we need to be. At the same time, continue to invest heavily in R&D. So we are, in fact, increasing our R&D expenditure next year. Just to explain a little bit more, looking at the bridge um, of revenues between 2017 uh, forecast and result, well, our rolling stock revenues were down slightly. This was down, t is, is primarily down to the non-recurring effort of setting up the Newton Aycliffe facility in the United Kingdom, which is now working extremely well, but it took a little bit longer uh, than we had forecast. Other than that, in revenue, um, some changes in foreign uh, exchange, but next year we see a higher volume of rolling stock manufacturing. So a higher volume of uh, a rolling stock. The service business that we have in the United Kingdom, which is, which is going to be very sizable, um, we see that starting to switch on and deliver revenues into the business, so we're confident in delivering that revenue forecast. From a profitability point of view, uh, you see here where we worked hard to improve the margin in rolling stock. Um, we've improved our SG&A, but we had the, the one-off effect of these uh, two projects, which we've made a provision for in the, in the turnkey element. Clearly, next year, more volumes, better mix, continue the margin improvement in rolling stock, we'll see our margin improve, contribute to the improvement in 2018. We will see the normalization of profitability in our turnkey area, and this was, is why we're confident of delivering 7% operating profit in 2018. I mentioned earlier cash flow uh, 2016, in fact, 2015 and 2014 were quite miserable from a cash flow uh, point of view, but you see here the effect of the down payment primarily on the Intercity Express project, uh, giving us a very uh, healthy cash position. Next year, uh, we will be investing more into our business, but we, we have a very healthy cash position uh, in the business. So let's look at, look at growth, look at the overall market. Well, the railway sector is still seeing uh, continued growth. The, the analysis from UNIFE, which is the trade association uh, in Europe, is predicting 3.2% uh, growth in the market. And the macro indicators have not changed in terms of population growth, uh, the environment, emission, and urbanization of people is all contributing towards growth in the railway sector. The sector's been quite busy, however, in terms of uh, major moves. So we've seen the proposed combination of two of the big European players, and we've seen uh, further inroads into the global market from Southeast Asian players. So it is a competitive marketplace, which is why we need to continue our development as a technological leader 
in the sector. And this is how we're going to do it. So we've grown our core offering. We now have a, a full lineup of business products and services for our customers. We are trans transitioning our product mix with an increase in maintenance, which is uh, favorable from a long-term revenue and margin position. Integrate that with IoT and digital so that we have a complete end-to-end -end solution from the origins of design all the way through to in-service and the feedback loop thereafter. And clearly to reach the target that Higashi Harasan has, has given us around one trillion yen, we also need to look at M&A. So we have a clear path uh, looking forward uh, for the business to continue on the very strong foundation we have, the combination with digital, further work in the marketplace to reach the target of being a very strong player uh, in the business. Just to give you an example of how we are uh, exploiting digital and IoT, this, this chart just shows you some of the technologies that we are deploying. So using fully digital design data, investing highly in robotics in terms of virtual homologation of our products and services, using computer models and graphics so that we can demonstrate the safety and compliance uh, of our products. And then taking that all the way through into service. So our, our trains, our new trains uh, in Europe are fitted with hundreds of sensors and we're feeding back every day gigabytes of data which is telling us exactly how the product is performing compared to our predictions and our design so that we can rapidly improve the design, we can extend our maintenance periods and reduce costs, and we can really transform the market-to-market -market solution of our products. So we can reduce the time to market, but also close the feedback loop of having actual data. And let me j just give you one example. We fitted a sensor into uh, the motors on one of our new trains. The motor was, the design specification was to operate up to 200 degrees centigrade. When we actually measured in service the actual temperature of the, the motor itself, it was operating at 60 degrees. So this feedback into design means we can reduce the size of the motor, we can reduce cost, and we can incre increase the maintenance cycle. So this is a real, very small example, but gives you a real life example of how digital technology is starting to transform our products and services for our customers. So just looking geographically, Europe uh, is our biggest market and where we have uh, the highest concentration of people. In the past, the organic growth in Europe has really been in the United Kingdom, um, but now we're seeing our order book growing substantially uh, in Italy, and we will see our revenues come through uh, quite strongly in Italy. We are also using our European factories as the test bed for our smart factory um, solution. So in Europe, we're, using, uh, we're implementing what we call product lifecycle management, which is really about how we digitize our whole uh, flow within the factory and also where we are capturing digital data from uh, our maintenance services. Japan, Asia Pacific, well, Japan is our home market. So, of course, Japan is extremely important. Japan is also one of the bases for technological advancement. So we're working very closely with our customers uh, in JR companies and others to co-create the next solution of digital innovation. So it's extremely important to our business that we remain strong in Japan. But it's not just Japan. Obviously, we are present uh, in a number of other markets uh, in Taiwan, uh, China, Vietnam, and Australia I mentioned earlier with Rio Tinto. Um, we also signed a significant contract for onboard signaling uh, in the Sydney area last year. So again, Australia is an important market for us. 
And finally, the United States. Um, our presence in the United States historically has been quite small. Um, we have contracts in Florida. We have contracts in uh, Honolulu uh, and now in Baltimore for rolling stock. Um, and Seldo SDS has a significant presence uh, in Pittsburgh in the US and is very active in a number of uh, cities implementing the latest generation signaling and train control systems. Uh, and this is very important from a safety perspective as the, uh, the National Rail Authority is, is driving uh, metro systems to become ever safer uh, in the US. So this is an important factor for us. Not just the US, um, in Canada there are significant plans for investment uh, in the railroads uh, using PPP uh, as a, uh, a funding vehicle. Again, we have experience uh, and Hitachi is a strong company is well placed uh, to bid for those contracts uh, in Canada. So in conclusion, um, we've grown and changed dramatically uh, over the last uh, four and a half, five years or so with 50% uh, compound an annual growth rate. At the, at the same time, we've managed to integrate and continue deliveries for our customers. We're investing heavily for the future. We are preparing and are prepared for the digital uh, evolution uh, of the sector. And in FY18, we're targeting 7% operating profit. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. So, uh, well, then we would like to move on to uh, the Q&A system. Uh, we will have uh, uh, Mr. Shinya Mitsudomi, a uh, vice president uh, of uh, um, the uh, railway system business unit, APAC, uh, joining uh, Mr. Doma. And uh, also we will have uh, Mr. Luca uh, Dakila, CFO of Railway System Business Unit, uh, joining Mr. Doma. You can ask your questions uh, either in Japanese or English. Uh, please uh, state your name and affiliation before asking your question. The floor is now open for questions. A question. I have two questions. Uh, first question is regarding M&A. Uh, you alluded to uh, M&A. Uh, what is the time frame you are considering M&A? What will be the objective uh, of the M&A? Is, uh, uh, is it because of the economies of scale? Is that the reason for uh, further M&A? Please elaborate uh, on your M&A strategy. That's my first question. The second question uh, is uh, regarding uh, revenue ratio of the uh, UK as well as Europe being very high. But uh, uh, in uh, uh, March of next year, Brexit uh, will be upon us. Uh, what is your uh, take on uh, Brexit? Uh, are you going to review your production plan because of Brexit? Uh. Thank you very much. Two very important questions. Um, first question regarding uh, M&A, we are looking, we're looking very widely uh, across the market. Uh, what's important is that we look at opportunities that really add value to our business. As I mentioned before, now we have a, a full lineup of capability. Uh, we have seen in the marketplace uh, some of the competitors buying digital companies to try to uh, enhance their digital offering. Well, within Hitachi, we already have that. Uh, so we are very well connected to Hitachi Vantara, Pentaho, Hitachi Consulting, working together very closely to deliver our digital offering. So I can't tell you which companies, because obviously I'm sure lots of people would like to know. Um, but we are looking very widely, and I think uh, we will our target is to deliver a 1 trillion yen business early in the 2020s. So that is really the time scale uh, to which uh, we are looking. Regarding Brexit, um, some of you may have been here two years ago for the Hitachi IR day, which was actually the day before the Brexit vote. And I was asked the question on Brexit, and my answer was, I'm not worried because it won't happen. So I'm not very good at uh, uh, predictions on Brexit, but then again, a lot of people in the UK were the same as me. Um, 
What can I say on Brexit? I think the reality is we still don't know uh, what the impact uh, of Brexit will be. Um, Hitachi, as well as a number of major Japanese companies, have made representations directly to the Prime Minister in the UK to say that it is extremely important for Japanese investors that we have tariff-free access between the United Kingdom and Europe. Um, and I think she's listening. So we will see. Um, does it affect our factory in, in the United Kingdom? Well, no, uh, I don't think so. Um, there are a number of opportunities that we are bidding for uh, in the UK, including London Tube, including High Speed 2, and a number of other uh, operators are looking to buy rolling stock. And I think our factory in the United Kingdom is adequately sized for the United Kingdom market. Um, and we have the opportunities where we can supplement the UK uh, with build from Italy and vice versa. That will suffice. Thank you very much. And we will now take the next question. So center row, fifth from the front, please. Question. I have two questions. First is on it Italy plant, Italian factory. I heard that, that there will be smart it will be smart factory in Italy, but before the acquisition, when it was Ansaldo Breda, I think the factory's productivity was low. Now how much has it improved? Could you give me the updated information? It's no, uh, it's no secret that before the acquisition, Anselmo Breda made some significant losses. Um, that was due to two reasons. One was they had a number of projects that were uh, particularly loss-making, which we excluded from the transaction. Secondly, there was really a lack of volume uh, in the in the factories in Italy. What we have done. Uh, over the last three years is really transformed the manufacturing process to improve the volume, but also Im dramatically improve the efficiency uh, in the factories in Italy. So now the, the productivity in our main factories in Italy is comparable to Casado uh, in Japan, which I think is a, is a great achievement. The application of digital technology, I think, will take it further ahead. Um, so I'm very, very pleased with uh, with the performance um, in Italy so far. Um, and I think there's a lot more to come uh, from what we've got, got there. We, are, we have made significant investments. Uh, we have invested heavily in robotics in terms of robot welding. Um, so the quality, again, is exactly what we would expect from our Japanese factories. Thank you very much. My second question is, so you have a target of 1 trillion yen and M&A. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong. In the presentation up to last year, it seems that uh, you said you don't need too much M&A. You can grow organically. That was the nuance I felt in the presentation up to last year. But this time, it seems like you focused a little more on M&A, stressed M&A. So if you do not do M&A, if we think of organic growth, do you think you can still achieve 1 trillion yen? Or will it be 600 billion, not much growth, just organically? Could you update and give us your input? I think, uh, I think last year I did mention m and actually, um, as part of that 1 trillion yen uh, target. Uh, organically, yes, we can reach 1 trillion yen organically, but I think it will take beyond the timescales of the early 2020s. So uh, as you know, Higashi Harasan is a very uh, ambitious guy. Uh, he's very keen and pushes me very hard uh, to continue to improve the business. So I think it's, it's an important part of the mix, but we will only invest if it makes sense uh, for us 
I think from, from my perspective, yes, top line is important, but equally bottom line is extremely important. So cash generation and profitability of the business is a real focus over the next two, three years. Understood. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Question. I have two questions. The first question is regarding Europe. Uh, with Siemens and Alstom uh, are going to be integrated, you will have the emergence of a uh, uh, formidable uh, rival. Will this have a change uh, in your strategy going forward? How are you going to review your strategy uh, upon this event? Now, the second question is regarding IoT. Uh, congestion monitoring as well as predictive maintenance uh, have uh, been mentioned uh, in your presentation. Are these uh, IoT technologies being provided to Japanese railway companies already? Okay. Um, let me just answer the second question first. Uh, in terms of IoT uh, development in Japan, uh, I think Japan has really been the, at the forefront of the digital revolution in railways historically and up to the present day uh, in terms of uh, traffic management, in terms of ATOS, in terms of Cosmos, and all of the advanced systems that we have uh, in Japan. Um, regarding sensors for maintenance, that's something that we're not working uh, directly for the rolling stock portion. Uh, we're working very much on the infrastructure portion, which will provide information to our customers as to the the operation uh, of their uh, their lines. Mr. Nomi-san, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that correct? I'm correct. Okay. Um, but clearly, the the IoT technology um, that we have and that we co-create uh, with our customers in Japan is fundamentally important for the design of our trains and how we can improve our maintenance going forward. I think and this is a personal opinion, but in Europe, the, uh, the real driver to reduce the maintenance cost is very much um, within our gift as the maintainer. I think in Japan, there is a very, very high level of reliability, punctuality, and service that is demanded by uh, Japan Railways. And the maintenance cycles are very much written into the regulations. So it is a more slightly more fixed system than it is uh, in Europe. So in Europe, we have a little bit more flexibility to reduce the cost and the whole life cost uh, of our maintenance systems. Um, regarding Siemens uh, and Alstom, well, we compete with Siemens and we compete with Alstom uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so wherever we are in the world, we're normally competing uh, with, with one of these guys. The fact that they've come together um, it reduces one competitor uh, in the marketplace. Um, but in reality, I'm more focused on Hitachi rather than worrying too much about Siemens Alstom. I'm worried about how we place ourselves as the technological leader. How do we come, become more competitive through the use of digital technology? And how do we really utilize the assets that we have within the Hitachi Rail business to ensure that our asset utilization is extremely high we're competitive and we continue to win market share. Of course, in the future, in order to grow and grow and grow, we're looking at a whole different range of, of combinations and strategies to compete at a global level. Any other questions? So on the corridor side, second from the front, please. Question. I have two questions. First, top line will grow to one trillion yen, and profitability and cash flow will also be your focus, as you mentioned. Now, how will you um, see the balance? What is your priority? If you could elaborate on the balance and the priority, uh, this year's forecast 
the company uh, has 8% margin, but uh, you, this, yours is 7%. And in the medium-term plan, it's 10%. Higashihara-san has set a high hurdle again. So that's the company-wide target, 10%. Uh, for the real business, how do you see the balance? Could you elaborate, please? And my second question is... Uh, this is not necessarily on rail, I'm sorry, but as Hitachi management, the diversification, as you diversify your management, as your experience as a foreign national, what kind of challenge have you gone through and what kind of outcome uh, have you enjoyed? And so as you see more foreign nationals, what kind of advice could you give to others? Okay. Interesting question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the, regarding the first question, um, you know, we're working on our next three-year plan. Uh, so we are focused on improving our profitability. Um, I think our, our performance historically in terms of dramatic growth in our revenue, um, I think that will slow a little bit. It's impossible to keep growing at 50% uh, every year. So this year we're seeing 12%, uh, but we are seeing significant improvement in profitability. And the drive is to continue to improve that. So we will contribute towards those overall Itachi targets. Uh, I'm, I'm confident of that because we have a very strong uh, and good business. Um, diversification uh, and um, my experience in Itachi, very interesting question. Somebody said to me the other day, um, did I realize that within the senior management team of Itachi Rail, we actually have uh, three British, three Italian, and three Japanese. That's actually not by design. <laughs> that, that's, that's just the, the capability of the people we have. And therefore, we have a very diverse team. Uh, and as you know, uh, Karen Boswell is the managing director of Attache Rail Europe uh, as a lady. And we, we're working very hard to increase the diversity of um, gender balance uh, within uh, Itachi Rail. Um, I've been working now for Itachi for 15 years. Um, so I, I kind of don't feel British and I don't feel Japanese. I, I feel very Japanese, I feel very international. Um, I'm, I've been very, very welcomed into the Hitachi family. And I think over time, Hitachi will continue to diversify. Uh, there, is, there is no doubt as Hitachi becomes a more global business, maybe um, the, the example shown by the rail business going from what was a very domestic company uh, 15 years ago um, to be transformed into a very, very global company. Now, uh, actually, Japanese is a minority within Itachi Rail, not by design, uh, not by design. But in terms of the management team, it's an extremely diverse um, team. Uh, and I welcome the contribution from uh, Japan, the contribution from from Italy and the contribution from other nationals. So I think it's a natural thing that will happen uh, within the business. Now we can take uh, one more question before we close the session. This will be the last question. A question. I have also two questions. Now, related to what you've just mentioned, you said that uh, in terms of uh, composition of the people, uh, Japanese people are already minority in Hitachi Rail, according to what you have said. In terms of business, uh, looking at this outlook and forecast, it seems that uh, uh, dom Japanese domestic market uh, top line growth is very gradual. And the ratio is 17% stable going forward uh, is the outlook for Japan. Does this mean that uh, opportunities for growth in Japan is limited? Or do you think there are still business opportunities to be had in Japan? That's my first question. Would you like to, as the expert in Japan, you can uh Japan is very stable, basically, and growth uh, can be expected uh, in the areas where IoD solutions can be brought to bear. 
and other areas within the group. Uh, with the uh, Railway System uh, BU and uh, with the Information Telecommunication BU, uh, we are working uh, uh, in collaboration and uh, the uh, revenue is uh, posted uh, elsewhere, so it is not directly reflected here in Japan uh, in our business. Uh, but uh, uh, we are hoping for significant growth in this area. We're working very uh, proactively uh, with uh, other uh, business units. Now, question regarding IoT. Uh, similar to a uh, previous question, currently regarding the activities in IoT, uh, it seems uh, that uh, it is not only in the factories, but uh, you are collecting data or gigabyte uh, data and being collected uh, from the rolling stock to be uh, utilized uh, in maintenance uh, for cost reduction and for other uh, convenience uh, enhancing activities. Is this something that has already been realized or is it still a work in progress? I would like to know what is the status of uh, utilization uh, in this area? Um, <clears throat> in terms of are we collecting data, yes we are. Uh, so we, I think it says in the presentation somewhere, we're, we're pumping back 13 gigabytes of data uh, every day. Um, in terms of how we use that data going forward, we need to build up a, a much bigger data lake uh, of information. Uh, what we've managed to do so far is compare the performance of our products in Italy with the performance of our products in the United Kingdom, and also compare uh, the relative systems that performance between different product types so that we can then really understand which particular systems are driving cost, reliability, or pure cost and consumption. So that's enabled us to do some, already some provisional design changes that are flowing through into the product, uh, which will enable us to reduce cost. But I think the opportunity here is truly enormous. It's really enormous. And the, I think the, the real value added that Itachi has with this, because we're working with Vantar and with, we're working with Pentaho, using the very advanced uh, analytic uh, software, it's extremely quick to take the information and then create the knowledge to then take action. So we've already started taking action, we started taking data, but I think we are uh, very much on the journey of what is going to be a very exciting development in, uh, in the rail sector. Uh, with this, uh, we would like to bring uh, the Railway System Business Unit explanation to a close. Thank you very much. Thank you.